in a shared device scheme, speed is tightly regulated. They can't go faster than 25. And they're often slowed by geo uh, geomapping. But that's still the one scheme, huh? Because, because it's a different risk. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the ECA Chat Podcast. We're here with Jeff, owner and founder of Evolve, and we got a special guest today. It's Nick from the Queensland Transport and Main Roads. Main Roads. I should definitely know on that. It's a bit of a tongue tie. Do you want to tell us a little bit about like who you are, who you work for, and what their role is? Sure. Um, so Queensland Transport and Main Roads, um, obviously that's a government department, um, big remit infrastructure, rules, you know, uh, road safety education, that kind of thing. Um, my specific patch, I'm the manager of the Road Rules and Emerging Technology team. Um, and so that name is relatively self-explanatory. We look after the road rules. So um, things like um, you know, all the rules governing trucks, cars, motorbikes, bikes, pedestrians, uh, e-skateboards, which we also call personal mobility devices or PMDs. I might slip into an acronym from time to time. PMDs is good. Yeah, PMDs, PEVs, EVs. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and then the emerging technology side, which obviously, the, you know, these sorts of um, devices straddle that really nicely. So essentially, um, in terms of, you know, my remit and why I'm here today, um, it's about how do we make sure these devices are being used safely? What are the rules? How do we communicate those? Um, uh, and, and yeah, and, and ultimately kind of how do they coexist with pedestrians, other path users, bicycles, vehicles, that sort of thing. So, And for the, the guys watching that aren't familiar, you're from Queensland, which is a state in Australia where Evolve HQ is actually based out of. So we're down the road from one another. Exactly. There's other states in Australia with other roles and of course other countries, but it's still like the same debate that's happening across the board. So it's, it's all interesting information. Um, Jeff's been involved in this space for over a decade now. Yeah, Can that's tell us what, what you were seeing with changes in legislation since day uh, one? Yeah, right. I mean, like I was saying before, like when we first started, it was like 2008, 2009, that's when we were prototyping and there were no PMDs around at all then. You know, there were definitely some e-bikes and scooters weren't a thing, skateboards weren't. Um, so when we officially started shipping boards out, it was around 2010, um, there were, weren't really any laws. Um, it, look, there was. It was all based around wattage, and it was like under 200 yeah. watt. That's what it had to be. Um, but, you know, technology started to change pretty quickly, and, and uh, you can get around, you know, the watts with, you know, battery power mm, and right. pretty quickly. Um, so really, like, I think all our markets uh germany europe like australia it, it was definitely primitive and then we've seen things change we've seen like skateboards start growing all our markets uh scooters really start to kick off you know around 2015 2016 especially with all like the higher stuff over in us when it just exploded and um yeah so it, it, i think uh, a lot of governments have been certainly chasing their tails and i've seen that there's change happening um, and people are looking for different ways to get about, you know, get around and be good for the environment. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's all sort of been coming to a head re really rapidly in, in, in all, of, all our markets. So it's interesting, interesting times ahead. What do you think? Yeah, well, Queensland has always sort of been the, the leader of the states when it comes to being progressive with the laws. Uh, was it 2019 or 2020 when it first was legalised? Yeah, we've actually been on a bit of a journey. So way back in 2013, we brought in rules um, that w were very specific to segways. Um, probably say we backed the wrong horse maybe initially. They haven't taken off as the predominant uh, micro-mobility. Um, but then in 2018, we brought in the essentially the rules that are mostly the same right to this day. Um, so that was about bringing in rules that made um, e-skateboards, e-scooters, solo wheels, e-self-balancing um, unicycles, as well as continuing segways as well. They were all sort of a category of vehicles that we call personal mobility devices or PMDs. Um, and, and, yeah, I think from our perspective, it was, you know, we were obviously aware that devices were in use prior to that. Um, but we saw a real explosion in the popularity of particularly scooters and skateboards um, since then. Um, and I think it's great. It was great hearing you talk before. I, we, uh, we, we talk a lot about enabling greener, 
cheaper mobility, the kind of mobility that links people from their, you know, their home to the train station, from the train station to the work. And so, um, yeah, we're, we've been on board, you know, for a while now. Yeah, in, in 2018, um, we went down to Melbourne to the National Road Transport Authority and there was a big debate down there. So there was like um, heads of government, uh, Department of Transport, New South Wales, Queensland, um, Northern Territory, and it wasn't just uh, heads of transport, there were all sorts of other governing bodies there as well. And, and the whole debate was around PMDs, how can we introduce this in a safe way into the general public? How can we coexist together that is good for the user, uh, but also it's good for public safety? And <clears throat> so we went down as a manufacturer. Lime was there as well. This is when Lime was trying to get into Australia. And, and um, and it was it was really it was a really interesting um, experience because hearing the debates how how the discussions all went there were round tables everywhere and there were key key people and and um, it was all really positive it was all around what are the key strategies that we can do um, and what we put forward we brought our product down we had a little display there and um, I've always thought. Um, the best way to, to police this is all around, and police have to do their job, right? And it was, I just keep thinking it's all around speed limits. Like, if you set a speed limit, it means that police don't have to get technical on product knowledge, um, power, you know, performance and all that. It's just like, don't go above this. If you do, you're going to get fine. And if you're not obeying, you know, the safety. So we, we went down, we put some recommendations forward, and it was purely around capping it at 25 um, got to wear helmets, um, you know, you can only ride on areas where there's no main traffic, uh, no white lines, just stick to back streets, stay off the road, and then pay attention in you know, congested areas where there's shared footpaths or whatever, just perhaps, you know, setting a speed limit to like under 15k an hour, under 10 or something like this, where there's congestion, don't ride through the Brisbane City Mall, all little mm. simple um, common sense things like that and so that's what we, we ended up putting forward and and um, that was in 2018 and, and we were quite surprised that um, that you know a few months later Queensland did get on the front foot and then they go hey this is what we're doing um, and we definitely noticed that a lot of those points that we put forward actually were, were part of the law and we were stoked and we were like this is it this is exactly how it should be you don't need to be riding over 25k now you know, the best riding speed for us as a product is the best carving speeds are sweet spots around 20 to 25, and that's when you have the most amount of fun. Um, so we, we were stoked that Queensland got on the front foot and were considering the users, um, not wrapping everyone up in cotton wool, but still setting a good framework that's, that's safe for everyone. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. Getting out of the grey area and making it black and white, I think, is what the users need yeah um, and that's where there's still so much confusion in the other states yeah. that just haven't quite caught up to where we are now yeah so sorry. i was just going to say i mean all those points i, I agree with I, I think for from our perspective when you regulate you legitimize and you give people you know boundaries to operate within you, you give police more tools so you know in the absence of any clear rules you've got police who have to use really clunky levers you know so you'll get you know for instance um, um offenses around using an illegal vehicle on a road um which fair enough if that's what the legal framework is that's what it is but i think most people will look at you know the sort of types of scooters and skateboards you see around and they don't see an unregistered vehicle in those they, they see you know something else and so what we wanted to do from day one is say let's give these devices a box which is what we often refer to we've you know as a defined set of dimensions you talked before about speed so moving away from um, things like motor capacity, which an electric motor is fraught from the start, but also almost impossible to assess, and go performance base, speed, weight, dimensions. Yeah. If you can define something that safely operates within that, it's so much easier to enforce, but it's also easy to understand, yeah. um, and then you get better compliance. So that's that's kind of been that mo. And you know, I was I was chuffed to hear you rattle off those things before because I was thinking, oh, tick tick tick. That's kind of the Queensland framework. So. Yeah. Yeah. It was really interesting because when we were down there too, there was a, an occupational therapist there and it was really interesting hearing her point of view. She re really was factoring the, the benefits of you know, being able to use these devices, you know, like a Sunday afternoon, beautiful day, you go down the beach and you get the wind in your face and it's all about fun and enjoyment. Um, 
so hearing you know, her point of view it wasn't just about trying to you know box it all into you know can't do this can't do that it was all about setting it up correctly but allowing the user to still have fun on the device and you know i think that's that's actually absolutely crucial and it feels like queensland have done a bloody good job um, with that and obviously there's been some you know some changes of late like we'd like to know i guess more about some of these changes and what do you think yeah i mean that's the reason we got you on you launched the street smart campaign mm -hmm. like First of November, was it? That's right, yeah. So tell us about what's changed, what's been redefined a little bit or tweaked up. What are, what are we trying to get across in the messaging of this campaign? Yeah, for sure. So I think maybe just the starting point is that there was already a pretty solid base. So um, things like mandatory helmet laws, don't carry passengers, you know, give way to pedestrians, all those things existed prior to 1 November and still exist. Um, so I think that's probably kind of one of the key things here is that, you know, you, you need to wear a helmet. I mean, that's a very, very obvious thing that I'm hoping that most users understand. Um, in terms of from 1 November, you know, what are the really key changes? I think the, the, the kind of the couple that if, if, if it's anything, the only thing that anyone took away from it would be changes around speed and some changes around where you can ride. So in terms of speed, what we've um, done is that previously there was a maximum speed of 25 kilometres an hour. That still exists, but what we've done is we've introduced another default speed limit on footpaths and shared paths of 12, um, and that's really about protecting pedestrians, essentially. Pedestrians, wheelchair users, people who are, who are in a more vulnerable state in those environments. Um, and we heard really loud and clear through kind of this has been about a 12-month journey for us in terms of the development of these laws and the comms packages. Throughout that, we talked to heaps and heaps of people, and particularly from groups like um, disability advocacy groups, um, groups who represent the elderly, we started to hear things like they're afraid to come out on paths in, you know, in, in Brisbane metropolitan areas in particular, but other areas where you see lots of scooters and skateboards, and that's not a good societal outcome. Um, so the, the slowing down of PMDs on footpaths and shared paths is a direct um, attempt to, to improve the safety of, of those paths. Um, whilst allowing scooters, skateboards and other PMDs still to do 25 in places that are really suitable for higher speeds. So bike paths, bike lanes, um, uh, local roads you talked before about that don't have a dividing line or median strip. So you kind of quintessential local road with a speed limit of 50 kilometres an hour or less. So um, that speed framework has been a real change. The other thing that um, complements the speed um, new speed frameworks, so those two default speed limits, 12 and 25, significantly increase penalties. And so, and we won't shy away from that. That's a, that's deliberate. We want there to be a big stick for really stupid behaviour, um, but one that's proportionate. So there's now four tiers of penalties. Previously, there was just one. If you, if you were doing 26 or 100, you got the same penalty. Now it's very similar to how you would um, yeah, go about it if you were speeding in a car. So there's... Um, uh, a first tier um, for sort of lower level speeding and then there's three other tiers that kick right up to the highest tier which is 30, 30 kilometres an hour or more um, and what that does is we hope that sends a really clear message that if you're doing you know so 30 kilometres an hour or more so if you're doing 55 that's quick that's really quick and and pretty dangerous for yourself and others and so there's a big there's a big penalty I think it's $575 um, but, you know, we, we appreciate that lower level speeding, while still dangerous and, and, and unsafe, is, is less risky. And so, we, you know, it's a more proportionate penalty structure. Um, so that's the speed one. I, I'm so, um, yeah, I went on a ride a couple of weeks ago. It was for Halloween. And we, we like to sort of get together at a community and, and, you know, these sort of key times. And everyone dresses up in these costumes. And we had some, you know, pizza afterward, which was pretty cool. And, and there was some... Definitely some conversations around some of the adjustments everyone's seen in the media or on social media about you know, the extra fines and the speed limits. And uh, there was a little bit of confusion, I must admit, around what, what the 12 kilometer hour speed um, and the shared port, uh, footpath mm -hmm. is like. So, I mean, what, what, what determines like a, a shared footpath? Yeah, I think, I think the simplest way of saying it is if, there's, if pedestrians can use it, it's shared. So take away all the sort of confusion about signage or anything like that. If you're on a path that can be both used by bicycles, pedestrians, PMDs, whatever it might be, it's a shared path. That's, that's really distinct from dedicated bike infrastructure. So you'll get dedicated bike paths and lanes that are signed with 
typically it's a bike symbol and the word only. I appreciate that's a little bit confusing because that's also an indication that PMDs can use it, but um, it's, it's very clear that pedestrians can't, so therefore it's suitable for faster speeds. So I think there's probably two different, um, um, two different types of pedestrian infrastructure. So the first is a footpath. I don't think too many people will struggle with that one. That's kind of your narrow suburban path or a very busy CBD footpath or something like that. Where I think you're getting at, um, Greg, is that there's, there's that um, a little bit more ambiguous path, which is wider. It's probably designed to look, uh, you know, but maybe it's new. It's you know, it's not got, it's not bumpy, um, but nonetheless, there is the ability for both si- bicycles, pedestrians, PMDs to use it. So it is a shared path, and the new 12 km hour rule does apply. But what the road rules do is that we get that that's, that's not going to work everywhere. And in fact, what probably is going to happen is you'll get non-compliance because people will be riding along thinking, this is a beautiful path. You know, I should be able to do 25 here. So what we um, have done is that the rules allow for local governments to go out and assess those paths and sign them appropriately. Um, and that doesn't have to be, we don't want you know, signs everywhere busying up the beautiful path or you know, beach environment or whatever it might be. So it can be as simple as just a, a marking on the path of, of, with paint. Um, to indicate to a PMD user that you can do up to 25 here. That's pretty cool. So when, when do you think that's going to happen? So it should be at, that should be happening now. Obviously, there'll be a little bit of a lag. You know, local governments have to you know, go out and make those assessments. Yeah. There's an engineering assessment. It's essentially a safety audit. They'd be out there saying how wide's the path, how many pedestrians use it, is it, you know, is it nice and um, smooth. Um, but assuming it passes all those ticks and you know it's a it's a nice wide path and it's not that's that's an interesting criteria there like if, if it was based on how wide it is um, it just comes down to an individual assessment so it's a lot of manpower involved yeah. which is still like we'll get there eventually uh, the individual signage you see that in like especially in the metropolitan areas like if you look at the Goodwill Bridge in Brisbane there's like I don't know 10 15 km an hour 20 is it and that's signed out everywhere. That's right. So it's like we recognise that this is an area where you can't go fast. We're signing everyone down. What does everyone mean? So like I mean cyclists. So cyclists cyclist as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that that's good. That's smart. Yeah, hundred percent. And so it should be like it's and it's that's that area. Right, and similarly, so local governments, um, and I should, I should say it's not always local governments, there'll be other path owners, sometimes it's, it's a private um, um, path, occasionally it's the state government or they're typically um, local governments control most of the path network just because it's on that more local environment. Um, but they have a lot of power, so they can choose to sign a path as suitable for 25 for, for PMDs, they can also choose to sign it for a, a different um, speed limit that would apply to what we would call all vehicles using paths. So that would be bicycles, PMDs. That's probably the end of the list. Um, so just to interject that quickly, because I didn't know until we had the conversation just before this podcast, what he's talking about is the federal and the state and the council level it all have the ability to set certain rules. Can you expand on that? Yeah, so that's probably, that's probably a good a good way of just, um, I suppose, teasing out the responsibility. So um, the Commonwealth government or the Australian government in, in Australia um, has the ability, their main role in this space is about importation. So you guys probably deal with them a bit, I imagine, if you're importing parts or anything like that. Um, and they're about saying what's a safe device to bring into the country. Um, the, the, what they, the, the parameters that they put around that are pretty much based on the road rules. Um, and, and, the, and because Queensland was an early mover, it was the Queensland rules. So that's, you know, the, the dimensions that we've set, the maximum weight that we've set, the maximum speed we've set. So the Commonwealth government will say as long as you meet that, you can bring your device in and you can sell it. Uh, the Queensland government, which is um, where my department is, we're, we're then about how you use that device. Uh, and so we use the road rules. So that's about maximum speeds, uh, where you can ride, thing, helmet use, no passengers, um, uh, drink and drug driving, that kind of stuff, uh, as well as enforcement because police do most of the enforcement. Uh, and then local governments have a kind of a two-part role in this. The first is an infrastructure owner. So I think that's the, what we've just been talking about. Their role is really to say, is this, is this infrastructure or path suitable for, first of all, for PMDs at all? They can install signage that says no PMDs. So um, Queen Street Mall in Brisbane is a good example, that very pedestrianised area that they have, you know, the, the council up there has installed signage. Um, uh, they, as part of that, they can also assess speed. So they can say, you know, this, this path is more suitable for 20 or 25 or whatever the case might be. Um, 
And then finally, local governments typically have the arrangements with the share providers. So I know in the case of skateboards, I don't think there are any um, share schemes out there at the moment. Um, but obviously for scooters, that's you know, been absolutely massive. And we've seen you know, Queensland started in Brisbane and now just about every sort of regional centre in Queensland has some shared scooter scheme. So the local governments can put um, controls through their agreements in about where they're deployed, how they're parked, uh, in some cases, um, you know, no-go zones, reduced speed zones, a whole kind of other tier of regulation, but that only applies to the shared schemes, uh, not the private use devices. So that's kind of the breakdown responsibility. I would say that the majority of the, it sits in that sort of the road rule space um, in terms of the types of rules that riders will interact with. Do you, do you know that councils have the ability to be like, okay, this isn't a 12 zone, this is a 25 zone, <laughs> yeah. so that would be good to see in the future? And I, I was talking to you before we started, but I, that's so critical because um, as, a, as a state government, and particularly the way the road rules are set up, I, I, I refer to them as kind of a blunt instrument, that, that they're really effective at setting a rule that it should exist the same everywhere. They're not very effective at local nuance. And that's fine. That's just, they're not intended to do that. And so what we've done is we've empowered, through the road rules, we've empowered the path owners to, to, sign, sign, to, to sign paths based on the, whatever those local requirements are. And so not only are there those safety parameters around width and pedestrian um, uh, uh, presence and um, there's, a, you know, there's a few other things, it's also about understanding where these devices are being used. So, so it's... We wouldn't have any expectation, and, lo and local governments would, would 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 never, I think, entertain signing every path on their network. Yeah. But I hazard a guess that in most of the sort of larger centres, the you know the, the kind of the main thoroughfares for scooters and skateboards are probably more limited. You know, it's it's where the good paths are. It's where you know, you know from 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 point A to point B that's going between two really desirable locations or whatever it is. They'll obviously be first off off the off the the rank in terms of assessing those paths and making those decisions. So yeah, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one. Like uh, we love riding through Brisbane. Like Brisbane's the like most beautiful city to explore, and we've got a big community up there. And um, often we do rides as, as a as a group. And um, one place where we love to ride, you know, from the regatta all the way into um, into where the botanical gardens are. And so that that's this, that path's an interesting one because it's hugely busy with pedestrians. Pedestrians should be on actually. Yeah. So and this is, I guess, I can totally understand where the confusion arises. So you're talking about uh, in, in Brisbane terms, that's the bicentennial bikeway that runs yeah. along the river, yeah. and it it's because you because on that path, um, pedestrians and cyclists are segregated. The twenty-five rule applies because there's not that same risk of you know weaving in and out of pedestrians or you know oh you're they're passing from time to time there might be a stray pedestrian but they shouldn't be there. Well, uh, it does happen because um, PNDs are limited to twenty-five, and then the cyclists well they don't like to get twenty-five. You know, twenty-five is really like a fast jog. Cyclists, <laughs> yeah, five, cyclists they you're setting they, a good you're setting a good pace if you can jog at twenty-five. No. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, <laughs> For a cyclist, like that's a yeah, issue like, of jogging. Yeah, so like, this is a big point of contention that came up in our community is the inconsistencies, I guess, between PEVs and traditional cyclists. So in a sense of a pathway like that, or even a normal bike path, like going next to a busy road, which is single lane, having a, a skate or a scooter limited to 25, cyclists are traveling faster than that. So you have two vehicles on the same pathway mm -hmm and move to different speeds. Is there a reason that is in place? And like, is that a point? Because we see it as a little bit dangerous too, because the cyclist is going to have to pull out. And then also- it's It causes frustration for the cyclist mm -hmm. because uh, the PND user is obeying the law. They're doing, they're working within the framework, but the cyclists usually want to go faster and they get angry at the PND or scooter user because they're going too slow, but the fact they're actually obeying the law mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the simplest answer is it's about risk. So that there's there's quite significant performance ca dif characteristics in, or differences in the performance characteristics between a bike and PMDs. The biggest by far is just the wheel size. Um, there's a few other um, issues around uh, center of um, gravity and you know, braking capacity and things like that. But in essence, and you know, this is the, the research that we did, and, and and most stakeholders seem to back this up. Going much more than 25 on particularly, say, scoop, scooters and um, skateboards that, you know, typically have, you know, relatively small diameter wheels, you, if, when you hit a little bump, 
things can go wrong quickly. Obviously, you know, you don't aim for bumps, but, you know, you never, you never know. And so the faster you go, you know, the greater the chance of injury. That's a probably a pretty obvious statement in physics. And so um, that's a, quite a big difference between bicycles and PMDs. The other one is that there's quite a big difference in terms of how that risk plays out. So we're not aware of any major issues with bicycles using bike infrastructure at higher speeds than 25. But what the data clearly shows in Queensland as one of those early movers in a PMD setting is there, you know, there tragically have been some pretty bad accidents, there have been some fatalities, there have been quite a few serious injuries at a rate much, much in excess of, of what we're seeing for bicycles. So it's kind of that regulation that is, is sort of proportionate in terms of risk you know, in enabling, legitimising, but also trying to ensure that they're used safely for both the rider and the path user. This probably leads on to like a different part of the conversation, but I saw at one of the research institutes in Brisbane said 92% of injuries on PMDs came from the rental schemes, which would then lead more so to people being inexperienced on the product as, I guess, the cause rather than speed itself. Yeah, I guess it's tricky with that sort of data because we don't know the exposure. So is it, for instance, because that data is drawn from four hospitals within Metro Brisbane, my my guess, and it is, it is a guess, but my guess is that the overwhelming majority of usage in that area is still the higher devices. So it's you do it, whenever you look at that kind of raw data, you've got to be able to understand some measure of usage to understand what's the risk. Um, but for sure, I think you I think you're right that there's going to be a level of inexperience, a level of um, you know joyriding and for the shared devices um, compared to the the privately owned. What we see is different risks. So it's not necessarily that one is more or less risky than the other. So for instance, for private devices, speed, it's all speed. Speed is the risk. We, we see devices that go you know 100, sometimes more than 100 kilometers an hour. And of course, that's, that's absolutely crazy. Um, in a shared device scheme, speed is tightly regulated. They can't go faster than 25. They're often slowed by geo uh, geomapping. But that's still the one scheme, huh? Because, because it's a different risk. They don't wear helmets. So, so and it's a compliance issue. Yeah, so, we, so, so it's about that sort of that, 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 that trade-off. And, and I would say that on balance, it's probably roughly even at the, at the moment. I think that, you know, that those stats have to be taken somewhat with a grain of salt. Is there any data, because like, you can't, it's difficult to compare PEVs to bicycles on a number of injuries, because obviously there's so many more bikes, but like a per capita number. Is there any way to get that sort of data? I couldn't find anything. Because people get that when there's like 6,000 hospitalizations on bikes. Like there's plenty of people dying on push bikes, but there's also thousands and thousands of people riding up. That's right. It's all about that measure of exposure. I'm not aware of, of data that has, has yet done that. So part of what the changes that we just put through also uh, have a greater data recording capability because we need to be informed. You know, this, this one November tranche of, of road rules won't be the last. This will be a continually evolving regulatory framework as this technology evolves. Um, but as it evolves in the future, however many years down the path it is when we review it again, we'll need to have better data to actually understand what is the risk, who's having accidents, why are they having accidents, which areas of the framework they're not complying with. So, um, yeah, I think so much depends on good data. And at the moment, you know, we're we're doing our best with what's available. Um, probably the only other thing I'd, I'd point I'd make, and, and it's a it's a point that is relevant for that comparison between PMDs and, and bicycles, is you have to remember that this is an evolving kind of fairly new space. And so what what we see is we're really proud that we were one of the first, certainly the first in Australia, to to, to regulate and to, to legitimise. Um, but it will be an it will be an iterative process. You know, we need to we need to make sure that the community come on board with that. That the, you know we're seeing lower rates of, of you know serious injuries and ideally no fatalities, obviously. Um, and then in time, as we see that, and as the as the community gets more more used to these technologies, as the infrastructure changes, because the big solution here, I mean, we we can talk about shared pass all we want. The best solution is that we have dedicated infrastructure, right? That for for cyclists for PMDs. As we see more and more of that um, rolled out, I think the regulatory framework can slowly adapt over time. So I guess what I say to people whenever they ask questions about why this or why, why that limit, it's, you know, that, that's better than what we had two weeks ago and perhaps in the future we'll have something better again, but it's that kind of process. Yeah, like, don't get us wrong, it's a 
lot better yeah, than New South Wales yeah. and Victoria. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've got a framework. We yeah. can use the, our devices, so it's great. It's yeah. just that's that's definitely one of the louder and clear things we're getting from mm. our customers. It just seems like a point of inconsistency. For sure. For sure. I think, sorry, just quickly circling back onto that speed issue, I think the, the one thing that we do say to users um, who are, you know, I would say the majority who want to comply, right? You know, there's obviously a few idiots out there as there are in all modes of transport, but the majority who want to do the right thing. It's if you're on a path that you're not sure, go 12. And, and I think in the near future, we're going to see signage rolled out that will make that much clearer um, so that, you know, on those really high thoroughfare PMD tracks, you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna slowly see an indication that council's giving you to say twenty is good here, twenty five is good here, whatever the case might be. It's, it's an interesting one, personally. Yeah. Like Jeff rides very different to some people. You heard him talking before, very much about fun. Yeah, like about the very car surfing on land and very, very recreational. Like, and he doesn't commute. You can't really commute at twelve if you want to cover a distance. No, that's right. The, the, I think that probably dovetails well into the sort of next major piece of the one November changes. So that's that we sort of talked a lot about speed. Um, the other big part is that we've increased access because we're aware of that, right? If you slow people down on footpaths, particularly just your normal suburban footpath, you've got to you've got to give some additional access so that you don't completely um, you know, ruin the commuting experience for those that are using them for that. Um, so the change that's happened here in, uh, in Queensland from 1 November is that um, we've allowed PMDs into some bike lanes um, and it's a risk-based model at this stage. So a bike lane on a road that's 50 kilometres an hour or less um, or a bike lane that's completely segregated from traffic. And we don't see too many of these to date. If anyone's familiar with Brisbane, um, you were seeing a few of those throughout the Brisbane CBD where we've got these, you know, there's the road and then a specific physically separated bike lane and then the footpath. Um, obviously that physically separated bike lane is the place to be. You know, we don't want rules that push you to either the road or the footpath and not on this beautiful piece of infrastructure in between. Um, so that's going to be a little bit of a slow burn. That, that, that infrastructure doesn't just immediately exist once the rules come into play. But what we hope to see, again, is that local governments and other road um, managers slowly start to shift their design. So when they're doing a road upgrade, when they're building a new road, they think about... How do you have a safe space for pedestrians, a safe space for cyclists and PMDs, and a safe space for drivers and uh, and, and, and your motorbike riders? And and that sort of segregated access, I think, will help so much with unlocking the potential and meaning you can go from A to B, you know, at 25 most of the way. I think, you know, for that to really work, we're definitely going to need... I, I just keep thinking those cyclists are definitely going to need to be going the same speed as those... PND users, because I can just see them getting, you know, congestion, um, causing sort of anger. Um, so that, that's that's what I think. I just I just think cyclists are obviously that they're, they're big. You've got an adult, the bikes are large. They still run into um, potential issues, same as an e-skate uh, with big wheels um, on a footpath. That like for me as a rider riding around. Um, if anyone, I, I can manoeuvre very quickly. If, if there's, I always look ahead. If a dog runs out in front of me or a, or a, or a kid or whatever, I can easily step off the board, stop, or swerve. On a bike, it's a lot harder, um, mm. I think. And so I, I think, I just keep thinking it's really important that cyclists um, should be, in the P&Ds, we should be all sharing the same rules. It kind of sounded like the... There was different risks associated between the two, but not really the data to back that up yet. The way I look at it, sorry, yeah. it's like if you go to a motorway, it's to me, it's like having a truck on a 110 zone highway that is only allowed to do 70 would probably present more of a risk than a benefit. Yeah, I guess so. Although ironically, we have rules like that. I mean, not quite seventy, but we do slow heavy vehicles down to slower speeds on yeah. on roads for that for the same similar purposes. Um, yeah, I think that the absence of data isn't necessarily the reason to kind of just let the let you know, open the floodgates as well. So, you know, part of the responsibility of the government here in terms of setting these rules is to do it sort of proportionately and iteratively. So if you just open the floodgates and there's a real spate of serious injuries or fatalities, it's a, you know, it's a terrible, terrible societal outcome. 
and probably, I hope you agree with me, this sets your industry back massively as well. You know, you, what you don't want is knee-jerk reactions around just ban them, which is, you know, what we are seeing in some of the other, um, you know, jurisdictions in Australia. So um, I, I think it's about, I don't, I don't disagree with you, and I, and I, I think it's just about that we, we, we need to get there kind of in a, you know, managed way. Um, the, I liked your point about that sort of alignment of rules for cyclists and PMDs with the exception of probably the two we've just spoken about, so speed and road access, the rules are pretty much now entirely harmonised. And that's another big change from 1 November. So previously, um, e-skateboards, e-scooters were considered pedestrians. Um, and so they had very similar rules to people walking or people in a, a wheelchair or a motorised wheelchair or something like that, um, or a, a, a non-powered skateboard. Um, and that, I think that made sense initially when we were really trying to understand what this technology was but what's happened, and it's very, very obvious to see, particularly in the last, say, four years since the, the 2018 changes, is you, know, you, you said before, Maddie, that you know, we're seeing c commuting. Um, we're seeing, uh, yeah, yes, some recreation, but in particular that sort of longer-range commuting. Um, some people ride up 30 k's on an e-scooter to work and back each day. That's, that's pretty much cycling when, you know, in terms of... So we've really m worked hard to align the road rules so that the same rules apply, um, the same penalties apply, um, and and what that does is it, it further entrenches this sort of th now kind of third category of vehicle on the road network. So you've got motor vehicle, which encompasses your heavy vehicles, your cars, your motorbikes, you've got bicycles, and now we've got PMDs as this sort of legitimate third vehicle on the road network. So um, I, I think we're getting there. I think it's just a bit of a process. Yeah, I mean, it's heading in the right direction. Like, we've seen the law changes in other countries where, I mean, the UK just finally pushed through a bit of legislation, but it excluded everything that wasn't an e-scooter. Mm -hmm. um, I think it might have even excluded privately owned ones that were just completely... It hasn't been fully done yet. It's it's on the cards. But the direction they're going yeah. is, is less um, in, in the direction we'd like to see. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's a positive step forward. Um, what do you see, like... What would you say the metrics are 12 months down the track to be like, what we're doing is working? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the ultimate metric is around safety. So crashes, um, severity, severity of injury, um, the severity of injury both of the user and of other people involved in that, um, in that crash. And part of that is about collecting the data. So the, you quoted some data before, which has come out of the Jamison Trauma Institute, which is a kind of collective of hospitals in Brisbane. I think that's, that's a fantastic initiative. Uh, we're doing some better data collection now where um, it, in, the, in the same way that any crash that happens on a road you know, you know, is, is reported and, and police investigate, the same thing can now happen for e-scooters and skateboards. So we'll start to actually get a, a much better granularity. Um, I don't think it's possible to say kind of at this stage what the number is. I mean, ob obviously the ideal number is zero, right? Zero. It's, it's impossible with these sort of things to even like, know when it all happens. Yeah. Because it's not like they're registered road vehicles where every crash is sort of, well, for the most part, going to get logged. Yeah, like, that's right. Know if no, that's the right. Fence. That's right. So we, we really only see the serious ones. So we would want to be seeing the serious ones decrease um, uh, or certainly not increase because we probably will, will see an increase in usage. So we don't, you know, it's that exposure metric I spoke about earlier. You've got to always be careful with your raw numbers. Um, uh, but then we're also keen to, you know, I suppose, any other inputs. So we work closely with the chair providers because they have a lot of data about usage. The private space is a little bit harder to, to, to measure. Um, we do things like go out and, um, and count, via, you know, the count the types of devices on, on, on road to get a sense of exposure. Um, we're all ears from your angle if, you know, if you guys have the kind of, you would obviously have sales data, but I don't know whether you do you collect anything through your devices that show you how often they've been used, where, that kind of stuff. Oh, we've got a um, an app that you know that shows all our users pretty much all around Queensland, right. around the world, and um, it's, does, it's not geo fenced or anything like yeah. that. But sure, we've got we've got all that. Yeah, we've got plenty of data. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, uh, yeah, I guess you know we can we can talk separately. But I think it, the more we know about how these devices are being used, the better we are informed to you know either confirm what we've done or uh, potentially make changes in the future. There's definitely a big argument, isn't there, for you know, the, the hire versus the, the private owner. Yeah, I know? think that's and the last like, major thing we want to sort of talk about. Sorry. Yeah, well, it's just, uh, I guess, they're the two 
two different types of people, aren't they, who use those products? And um, and I know users of uh, skateboards um, have been using the product for a long time. They know where to ride. They they know what to avoid. And of course, there's that small amount who are a little bit reckless. Don't get me wrong. That's cross board with any sort of um, device. Um, and it's the same with scooters. I would have thought you know the guys who been using the product for a long time. Um, they know what to look out for. They you know respect pedestrians and. And then, then you get someone who's completely new and introduced straight onto a higher scooter. Um, it's fun, you know. It's the first time mm-hmm. getting on this product, and so I guess that they have a, a different way of using the product as well. But they don't probably think ahead, mm-hmm. you know, and, and be aware of the surroundings. And um, you know, I think it, it's it's an interesting discussion, like you know, getting the data from private owners versus uh, you know the people who like to joyride. Mm. And that's easiest for you to get that data, right? Mm. It's through uh, the high companies versus the own private owners. I don't know how you're going to get all that. They just use the scooters in very different ways than yeah. higher mobs. Yeah. It's been a bit of catch-22 with those guys because you spoke before about, like, is it good for the industry or not? Those guys came in with, I guess, big sort of PR and legal teams and they were able to engage government and get... They were really the ones that got e-scooters more mainstream mm. in Australia sure. so they came in they put them everywhere but then the flip side of it was they were the ones where you had 15 year old kids getting on a lot of drunk people mm. a lot of like you know a lot of these fatalities are happening at midnight on Saturday like we know mm. the situation that led up to that I was just going to say interestingly um, and obviously uh, every every fatality is a tragedy I think just about all of them have been on private devices though. So, so I, I think it, it's, I don't, I get what you're saying. I, I get that there's a difference in user profile, a difference in, in the types of risks they're taking. But I think by virtue of the fact that the, sh- the shared devices are speed limited, I think that is the game changer um, in terms of risk profile. So the, the types of incidents that are happening are serious often, but but not the really, really bad ones. So I guess I just say that to say, you know, we, we, it, 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 you've got to kind of balance it out. There's there's not this sort of perfect situation where there's you know there's the really shining light safe users and the and the risky ones. I think that you know there's there's different risks in in both camps. I don't know how involved you are with like what the police actually do when they do their crackdowns because we know they've done speed traps and stuff. Say in the morning commute, is there anything like that for like the late night users in say the city where we. We know those guys without helmets, or they might be under the influence. Yeah, sure. Have they been doing that? Yeah, system? absolutely. So, I mean, typically, um, and obviously, this is mostly within the remit of the Queensland Police Service, but typically, the way they design a, um, a crackdown or an enforcement blitz is is to kind of have a, a number of different targets across that whatever period they're doing. So it'll be you know commuters sometimes, um, but then absolutely, you know, they'll go into those nightlife precincts and they'll be looking for. Helmet use for passengers, the doubling on scooters and and drink and drug riding, um, and they'll have they'll have you know really specifically out there because the it's the same with all road users whether you're driving a truck riding a scooter or a skateboard it doesn't matter visible police presence the threat of enforcement is the number one deterrent for doing something stupid we we can design the best rules the best comms campaigns in the world the police officer who stands there and says oh you come over is the one that's going to get through so. They're really conscious of that. Um, it's something that I know they get, they're going to continually ramp up now that we have these new rules. We've done more education um, and it won't just be Brisbane-centric. So they'll be out all across Queensland um, making sure that people, you know, first and foremost understand the rules. They're all armed with educational materials. They hand out little flyers that have QR codes to our rules and things like that. But, you know, for the people doing the wrong thing, they can also expect to get fined. <laughs> Yeah, we've definitely been seeing a lot of marketing. There's no doubt about it. Seeing it on TV, on uh, Facebook, social media. There's all the campaigns are out there. Um, certainly, some interesting discussions on on, on under the comments. Yeah. Would you guys pay close attention to see all the feedback? Yeah, I mean, not I mean, not me personally, but yeah. but yeah, for sure, they're all moderated. Um, and so we we get the sense of the themes. I think the things we've talked about today are very similar to the sorts of themes that have come out. So through some of that um, commentary already, I think the you know, the, the, it's the where, so, you know, what paths can I use? You know, can I use bike lanes? What roads can I use? The speed, I think they're, they're, they're common sorts of threads. Um, yeah, and then, you know, we, we get a range of comments. I think this is probably true of any social media campaign. Yeah. We get the people that say, love it, you've killed it, you've done a great job. 
I get the people that say, yeah. you, you haven't done such a great job and they might not use those yeah. words. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and you, you sort of touched on it with like the most effective thing is a policeman standing there and doing it. I'm like, I do the marketing here and it's something we do and most businesses would do, which I guess is get different to government. Your thing is we like lead with value. So we're like, you should get a skateboard because it's going to make you stoked. Whereas a lot of these ads, they sort of start from a place of negativity or like inducing fear, which might be a more effective way of telling people, hey, this bad shit is going to happen. But also I, I see it as not a promotion of PEVs. Mm. I see it as like a deterrent. So when someone, it, when the leading line is, you will be fined up to $575, as opposed to thinking of getting an electric scooter for Christmas, learn what you can and can't do. I think that would drastically affect the tone in the comment section and maybe how people interact with it. I don't know if it's the end result will be as many people paying attention, but from a marketing perspective, I think we would be better served. Sure. Yeah, I mean, so we work closely with our comms and marketing area within the department. I'm a, I'm a regulatory boffin, so I won't profess to be the expert about comms, but um, they go out and test all those campaigns. I, I think from what I understand, the, the people that um, you know respond um, and, and they do focus groups with, I think do say that, that, that you know, leading with the stick is a more effective tool. Um, because I guess it's about what's our role. You know, I think absolutely you know, your role here is to get people to buy skateboards, right? Um, our role is to make sure people know the rules. And so um, we're not so in interested necessarily in promoting the industry. Although, as I said, we're very supportive of it and we're very proud that the rules have enabled, um, you know, a, a sense of legitimacy and a massive increase in uptake. Um, and we see benefits for that, of course. But that's not our role. Our role is to say, if you have one, if you, th you know, if you're thinking of getting one, this is what you need to understand to use it safely. Um, and I guess it's about too that you know, we're not just communicating to the users themselves, although of course they're our primary audience. We're communicating to the entire po population. So we're trying to impress on the people I spoke about earlier. You know, the, who might have disability or, or or an elderly person to say it's safe to come out again. You know, go live your life, and and you should expect that. You know, the users will be slowed down, they'll be acting responsibly and they'll, they'll give you, a, you know, a, a nice comfortable path experience. So all of that sort of balances, I think, into the tactics that are used. Well, I mean, I've learned stuff today and I, I live and breathe this stuff. So I think it's, it's quite interesting, like a few of the points you raised. One thing that you said earlier that I didn't quite catch was these new set of rules allow PMDs to go in other kinds of bike lanes that they previously couldn't. Mm -hmm. I was under the impression they were allowed in all bike lanes or anywhere a bike could go, a PMD could go. Is that not? No. So probably another point of, of, of clarification. So I might just start with kind of the hierarchy. So where can a PMD be used? A path, so that's a footpath, a shared path, obviously noting that conversation we had about speed. A bike path, so that's, a, that's an off-road facility. Um, uh, a separated path, which is that example you, you gave around the um, the bikeway that runs between the um, the regatta and the CBD in Brisbane, um, and I know that's a lot of confusing terminology, but all of those things are where cars can't. So you know, if it's a path, you can use it. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, they can, yeah, PMDs can be used on local streets. So this is a, a road with a speed limit of fifty kilometres or less and no dividing line or median strip. Um, you know, your very classical quiet local street. Of course, you know, it makes sense to be there other than your bumpy footpath or your you know, grassy nature strip. The bit in between is what's changed. So previously, PMDs couldn't access any bike lanes. The reason for that is that bike lanes are typically built on quite high-speed roads. Yeah, you know, by, local governments don't put bike lanes on, on too many 50-kilometre-hour roads because they're normally a safer environment. They are those local streets. Um, uh, uh, and so previously PMDs couldn't use them. We get that that was confusing. And in particular, when you slow them down on footpaths, you need to, you need to you know, give something in return. And so what we've done is say a bike lane um, that's on a road up to 50 kilometres an hour. And we are, I know I said that you don't see too many of them, but we're starting to see more and more of those um, as, as councils think about sort of safe interactions for bikes and PMDs. As well as, and I think the game changer in this space is that physical separation. So it's still on the road, but there's a bollard, a barrier, a curb, something that separates a car from the bike infrastructure. Meaning, 
you're not going to get people who you know might be using their mobile phone and obviously that's not something also that we would like people not to do but they're distracted we don't want the risk that they you know they're swerving and because you're dealing with for skateboard and scooter users you're dealing with extremely vulnerable users you know they you can have all the padding in the world but you're going to come off second best if you get hit by a, a motor vehicle so um, that is the change is, is really about saying let's see if we can find that safe space on the road for for PMDs um, I don't know say for the Gold Coast as well as I know Brisbane obviously but there's a couple of really great linkages which you could be coming from anywhere from you know sort of 15 20 k's out of the city and you could pretty much link up off-road paths bike lanes that you can now access um, and maybe a little bit of footpath use but not too much and get there where you want to go and probably for the most part be able to do 25. So that, that's our goal is, you know, in time as that infrastructure catches up, you'll have this network that makes sense, it's intuitive um, and it's legal. That'll be awesome, you know, when we get to that space finally, yeah. I think. Yeah. It's exactly what we all want. We all want to have fun. Yeah. 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 Safe environment. That's it. And safe for everyone, I think, is key. I mean, you know, obviously, user safety, I know, is going to be forefront in your mind, but the safety of those other users, um, because, you know, it, it ultimately, from a government perspective, if, if, if other people don't feel safe, you know, and, and that's probably the silent majority, I would say, in the case of PMDs who don't write PMDs, the, the laws aren't going to be accepted. The, you know, these devices aren't going to be accepted. So we need to make sure the rules kind of integrate PMDs safely into the network. Um, yeah, so that, so that everyone's kind of... Do you think New South Wales and Victoria are going to sort of catch up to Queensland at some <laughs> stage? I think that's a question for them. I mean, we think Queensland's the best, obviously. <laughs> they won't come back. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I mean, I think, you know, you said before you were down at the, um, the NTC um, workshops, you know, and obviously out of that, the, the, the Australian road rules, which are um, essentially the model law that we all base our road rules on, they were changed at the time to adopt the Queensland model. So the model's there, um, but when, when states are ready to adopt, I guess. Yeah, awesome. I think that's pretty much going to do us. So thanks so much for coming down. I know us at Evolve really love to be part of the conversation. Yeah, so sure. when it does come to engaging, to, yeah, to sure. find information, like we're more than happy to talk to you, give you some data where we can. Yeah. And I've heard from our local community to like, I don't know how much you engage community groups, but a lot of them were like, we want to be part of the conversation in some capacity. So reaching out to Facebook groups and stuff like that is a good way to access the right people quite yeah, quickly. Sure. And they're more than happy to get involved. Sure. I think just the last thing I'd say in closing, and we can't, you, you, as one of you mentioned, um, the street smarts. I reckon if, if anyone's in any doubt, just Google street smarts PMD. We'll put the link in the bio. Because it's all there and we've done a good job i think of trying to set that well here's me saying we've done a good job giving myself a pat on the back but we've tried to set it out in a way that it makes sense and is simple you know cut the guff and just say what are the sort of top 10 rules you need to know and so that's the way that's the place to go i think yeah well we're happy to do the same thing here for our customer service and we're talking about the customers so we've got it all printed up as well and when we get any questions, emails coming through, we're always referring to that. Every now and then we get someone saying, hey, where can I use this? And it makes it hard for us because we do distribute through Australia and you know, someone from Sydney asking the question, but then we've got someone in Queensland. So yeah, we're really hoping that the other states do um, follow what Queensland's doing. Thanks for the work. And no yeah, worries. thanks really for having me. We'll get you back really in to catch up next time. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone.